So you're kind of like a mortician. A little he, bit. He gets the trees after the tree murderers are done with them. <laughs> <laughs> Kill it. <laughs> Hey, welcome back. Today I'm in Lawrence, South Carolina with Matt from M2 Lumber and we're going to learn the truth about drying wood and why it's so important that you use properly dried wood for your projects. I've always heard if you want to air dry lumber, it's basically a, a year per inch. So if I wanted to dry a four inch maple slab, I would have four years to wait, right? Uh, not exactly, no. The year per inch rule is pretty much only good up to about maybe two inches. Okay. And that even really depends on what species of wood we're talking about. The thicker the wood, it becomes ex exponentially longer drying times. Uh, a big beam of four to five inches thick could take five years or longer. Truthfully, if you actually are able to measure all the way down to the core of the center of that beam, you'll probably find that it's not dry. So the one year per inch rule just went out the window? Yeah, pretty much. We have a lot to learn in this video. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. Make sure you're sticking around. Wood has always been a passion of mine for the last 15 years. There's nothing quite like milling, taking a tree that would normally be dumped in a landfill and turning it into something beautiful and useful that can last for decades. Matt was just explaining that the importance of getting good quality lumber actually starts on the sawmill with the way you cut the log. You wanna tell us why that matters? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of things go into it. Uh, if you look at wood movement, which is one of the number one things that we see as woodworkers as a defect with the lumber, that starts with the grain that's in a board, which comes from the shape and how we cut it out of the log. So if you have a curved log, you're gonna get curved grain. If you have even a straight log and you cut it at a slant, you can still get cathedral or slanting grain, which can cause movement. So a lot of that has to be considered from a sawyer's perspective, but you as a woodworker can know this and be looking out for it when you're going to buy your wood. So basically you're gonna save time and money if you're not buying material that's gonna warp, twist, or bend on you, or will minimize the warp twisting or bending. <laughs> Another common thing that people ask us all the time while we're down here talking about it is because we cut wood for the public. People bring us logs all the time and they'll ask, how long should I let my log dry before I have it milled? And that is the absolute worst thing that you can do. You don't want to let a log dry for any period of time because as you do, you get uneven drying stresses in the wood and when you go to mill it up, it's just going to immediately move and twist on you. Now we have logs drying at our house that are probably a year and a half, two years old and the checking on the end of them is just insane. Yeah, yeah. I think they're going to end up either cookies or firewood. Yep. <clears throat> and a lot of times if you leave it on the ground and it has contact with the ground, fungus, bacteria is going to get in there and start to decompose it. We usually try to mill up logs within six months of getting them delivered, otherwise they start to degrade pretty quickly. Good to know. Next thing we need to think about is how the lumber is stacked and stickered. If you don't do a good job on that, that can cause some issues right off the bat. Yep, not just how, but also why. So a lot of times when we cut a log and we turn it into lumber, it starts off 40 to 50% moisture content, super, super high. You don't want to put that in a kiln right away because that's going to give you an increased chance of lots of drying defects. So we let our stuff air dry anywhere from three to six months. What we're doing is we're shooting for what they call a fiber saturation point, which is around 20% moisture content. That will vary depending on the species of the wood and how thick we cut it. But we put these stickers in between to allow proper airflow and also to help keep our boards from deforming. I like to think of a wet piece of wood like a giant spaghetti noodle. It's gonna take whatever shape it can that it's laying on. Okay. How often should we be seeing stickers in the pile? Let's say if you got 12 foot material that's an inch and a half thick. I mean, is a sticker every four foot okay? No, not every four feet. I'd say it really depends on what it's gonna be used for and the thickness of it as well. Um, some places are as extreme as every 18 inches. Um, if you're doing you know, really high quality veneer grade wood that's very valuable, that's probably a smart thing to do. Um, if you're just doing you know, general construction lumber, then you could probably get away with every three feet. We just try to minimize any kind of deformation. So again, that's gonna depend on not just where the stickers are placed, but how evenly they're placed as well mm -hmm. and the thickness in the species. So we're typically doing about every 24 inches on ours. Behind you, I see you have this natural edge log um, also looks like ratchet strap together. What's that about? Yeah, so we do strap our lumber down after it's milled. That allows us to A, move it in one big pack without it falling around all over the place. And B, it does help a little bit to help keep it flat. Um, we can put lots of tension on it with these ratchet straps. And just to give you an idea of how much wood moves, we can look at some of these over here. They were tight when we put it and banded it together. And now you can see how loose they are because the wood shrinks as it dries. Okay. 
Uh, right at the beginning of the video, you mentioned that, you know, the year, year of drying, if you're going to air dry per inch, is not really a thing. And it changes from species to species and depending on the thickness. Can you give us just a quick rundown on what some of the species, let's say they're three inches thick, would take a lot longer to dry than maybe other species? Yeah, sure. So uh, eastern red cedar, for example, is a very common one that we mill up all the time around here, as well as poplar. Um, those are very low density woods. Most people know that they're pretty soft. They dry very fast. Um, cedar also doesn't have a lot of moisture in it to start with because it's, it's sort of a drier wood species. So those, if you cut them one inch thick, they could very easily dry within a year, probably even faster, maybe even six months. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the one year per inch is hurting you because it can actually dry faster. If you're talking about a really dense species like white oak, that takes forever. Uh, a two inch thick piece of white oak will not be dry in two years. It may be on the surface, which is misleading, but if you have some proper moisture measuring equipment, you'll see that in the center of the wood, it's nowhere near dry. One of the things I think is important, and I learned the hard way young into my woodworking career, is making sure that I'm buying from a reputable sawmill and somebody that is actually drying the material. Now there's a few different ways that material can get dried properly. My favorite material to use is something that comes out of a vacuum kiln. But there are really good solar kilns out there. They take a little longer. You can't control the moisture all the way through them normally. The really higher end ones you can. So you have a lot of experience with both um, solar kiln and vacuum kiln. You wanna tell us a little bit about the solar kiln and what the benefits are of maybe a solar kiln over a vacuum kiln? Yeah, absolutely. So you hit the nail on the head. When we first started this business, we built our own solar kiln. And the number one benefit for most people with a solar kiln is very, very low cost. Um, the operating cost is practically free because it runs off solar power. Uh, the total investment for us to build our own solar kiln was about $6,000. So very, very cheap. The problem with the solar kiln is not necessarily the temperature because it very easily in the south gets up to 160 degrees. The problem becomes controlling the even distribution of that temperature. So without investing heavily in uh, mechanical airflow and things like this with a solar kiln, it's gonna be difficult to get an even temperature distribution the way that they're designed and which means built. even drying is going to even drying is yes. going to be harder to achieve. We we learned very quickly that with our solar kiln, we were seeing temperature distribution variations as much as 40 degrees from the top of a stack of lumber to the bottom, and that's a problem because if you read your USDA's published kiln dryers operator manual, yes, that's actually a thing you Nobody's can download. Nobody's read that, but you you know that, right? <laughs> yes, that's actually a thing you can download on the internet. Uh, it tells you that you need to hit 140 degrees for a minimum of four hours to, in order to kiln dry wood to kill bugs and sterilize it. That's tough to do in a solar kiln, even in the southeast where it's really hot. Okay, so what method do you use for drying now? So now we use a vacuum kiln. We went with the iDry system. It's a great uh, machine. It's very simple and easy to operate. It holds about 1,500 to 2,000 board feet, depending on how we load it. And now we can dry wood with no question about quality and even distribution of temperature up to uh, 2,000 board feet in a matter of two weeks. To be fair, I can vouch for that because I don't buy my lumber anywhere else now. Hmm. Um, one of the nice things about being an operation like yourself is that you can afford to sell lumber a little bit cheaper than you'll be able to find at places like Rockler or Woodcraft, which you know have great lumber and the great selections, but their prices are a little bit higher. Where you can you can bet you can beat those prices because you're not a reseller; you're actually milling the material. Yeah, and to be fair, we do have some exotic wood and some really nice slabs in there that we import ourselves as well. Uh -huh. And the price on those are higher and it's because we're having to pay a middleman. We're having to pay another mill that milled it up and then shipped it to us. So yes, if you're shopping with a, a local sawmill, you should expect to have cheaper prices because there is no middleman. You right. just need to make sure the quality is good and then it's usually a great deal. One of the things that I've always done when I go to sawmills is bring a moisture meter with me. Now, honestly, the sawmill should have a moisture meter that they can show you the moisture content of the material you're Absolutely. buying. Absolutely. Yep. So never be embarrassed to whip out a moisture meter at a sawmill. You want to make sure that the money that you're spending is a good investment and you're getting the right moisture content. That said, what kind of moisture content should I be looking for, especially like in South Carolina here where it's a high moisture area? Yep. When I'm walking down one of your aisles, what kind of moisture content should I be looking for to bring home with me? Sure, yeah. So most lumber yards that you go to shop at, at sawmills, we're not gonna have lumber or slabs in a conditioned space. It's just too expensive to do, especially if you have a lot of it. So you will have some fluctu fluctuation in that moisture content. Um, all wood is going to reach equilibrium moisture content. However, if it is kiln dried, you get a lot of grain collapse in the wood cells, and this really does prevent it from absorbing 
moisture the same way that a non-kiln dried piece of wood will. Mm -hmm. So typically when we kiln dry stuff, we're trying to get it around six to 8% as a core reading. It won't get back up to 12% typically unless it just gets drenched as a normal air dried piece of wood will. You might see it climb to eight or nine, maybe even 10%, but usually not above that, even in an unconditioned space. Okay, well that's good information. It's yeah. not something I would, I would even think about. Now we use, most people don't. In a lot of the building I've done in the past, we use higher moisture material for when we want to steam bend or we want to mm -hmm. form or shape material, thermoforming mm -hmm. typically. Uh, but when I'm looking for real stable material, I'm going to put in a tabletop or a dresser. I don't want to be buying anything over 8%, 9%. Is that really where I want to be at? Yeah, I mean, truthfully, 10% is probably going to be fine for our region mm -hmm. because it what you're what you're aiming for is what is the percentage of the moisture in the environment you're going to be putting it in eventually so if I'm building if I'm building furniture here and setting it to southern Arizona I'm, I might want to think about what I'm doing yes and even even a step further I built a table once and sent it to my sister-in-law in New Hampshire and you wouldn't think it's New Hampshire being an extremely dry place, but it's extremely cold. And they run the heat in their house over six months of the year. A lot of the homes up there will actually have humidifiers to try to put uh, moisture back into the environment. So their home is very, very dry most of the year, down to 6%. So again, what's the environment that it's gonna be in? So if you're planning on doing things like that, plan on, in, make sure the joinery you're using equates for those conditions. Yes, absolutely. Reasons I take what Matt tells me so seriously is that you've been doing this for a good many years now, and you also run a furniture, a custom furniture shop. So you're building custom furniture out of the material that you're milling and drying. I mean, every mistake that you've ever made as a woodworker sourcing wood, uh, we've done it too. So I'm not standing here telling you that we're perfect. We have made mistakes. We have case hardened wood. We have warped it. We have used wet wood. We've done all the things that you're not supposed to do, which mm -hmm. is how we know not to do it. Mm -hmm. The only thing perfect with man is his mustache. This is kind of true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you explain to us a little bit more about moisture meters and the type of moisture meters that are available and maybe offer some insight on which ones are a little bit better quality? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the most important thing I think as a woodworker to understand about moisture is that it's not a finite number. It is not black and white. Moisture will change as you get deeper into a piece of wood, and that's just physics. That's the way wood naturally is. It's a hygrophobic material, which means it absorbs and releases moisture from the humidity of the air. So on the surface, where it's easiest for it to evaporate, it will be drier naturally. Down inside the wood, it will be wetter. That we talked about earlier, the thicker the piece of wood is, the more it's going to trap and hold that moisture in. So when you're considering a moisture meter, you should be considering what are you actually trying to measure and why. We're a lumber producer, so we're trying to measure the quality of the moisture of the wood all the way down in its core. This moisture meter we have here is a Delmhorst J2000. It allows us to use up to inch and a half thick, inch and a half long probes to measure the moisture all the way down to the center of a piece of wood. So as someone who's producing and selling lumber, it's really critical for me to know that it's actually dry. Now, if you're just out shopping and checking to see what the moisture is, your typical moisture meter is only gonna have about quarter inch probes. And that'll give you an idea what the surface is, but not necessarily down to the core. Can you say what that is again? This is a Delmhorst J2000 moisture meter. Now this is a $500 moisture meter. Ooh, so I hot in here when you said that. This is a $500 moisture meter, so I don't expect any woodworker to go out and buy this. But if you're buying from a reputable lumber source, I would expect them to have it, especially if they're producing themselves. Now keep in mind, most lumber yards aren't producing lumber. They're just a warehouse. So they may not have something like this. But if you're buying from a sawmill, I would highly expect that they should. So Matt, thank you for letting us take up your entire morning talking about drying wood and how important it is. Uh, why don't you tell the folks where you're at and where they can reach you? Sure. So we're in Lawrence, South Carolina currently. We're about 25 minutes south of Greenville, if you're familiar with the area, uh, about an hour north of Columbia. They can reach us online at our website, m2lumber.com. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, Google, you name it. I'm gonna put links down in the description box below so you can check those out. And I just wanna say it is really important that when you're making projects, especially ones that you wanna keep around for many years to come, to get dry lumber, to deal with reputable people like Matt when you can find them. And when you can't find them, places like Rockler and Woodcraft are not bad places. They're just probably plan on spending a little bit more money. Have a good one. Adios. <laughs>